So now it does all of its little magic and calculations in the background and it, it, it lies to your trainer. Hello friends, welcome back to the channel. If you are new here, my name is Sarah and I make videos about health and fitness and all of those fancy pants things, endurance sports. So if that's something that you're into, well maybe you'll hit the fancy pants subscribe button. Or don't, I'm not in charge of you. You choose your own destiny. You chose to click on this video. I think that's awesome. You're a good egg. Anybody ever tell you that? Good egg, thanks for coming. But today's video is a follow-up to one that I made a little bit over a year ago now, and it was about trainer difficulty. And at the time I made a video to help to explain trainer difficulty to newer Zwifters, right? Trying to explain good use cases for it, trying to dispel some of the misunderstanding when it comes to trainer difficulty. And it's a topic of hot debate on Zwift. And I gave people a number of good tools to use to get the most out of Zwift in terms of using that slider to best benefit their training. But at the end of that video, I did say that I left a lot on the table in terms of how the actual algorithm works. And I don't think I did the best job at dispelling the major myth that I have the biggest problem with, and that is when people call this virtual gearing. Now, I'm not saying this to talk down to anybody or, or condescend to anybody or think anybody's stupid for thinking this because it's very easy to understand why people get into this line of thinking. But there are a number of people who are very belligerent about it and they don't accept kind of the facts for what they are even when they're presented to them in a rational manner. But what I wanna do is I wanna kind of provide to you some evidence and understanding of the platform to explain why it's not virtual gearing. It's not virtual gearing at all. It's not even close. I wouldn't use it as a virtual gearbox because you're going to end up completely changing the dynamics of the game. Now, if you still want to change your ter trainer difficulty and turn it down to whatever percentage you want to, that's fine. 100% trainer difficulty is not the end all be all of Zwift. I'm just making this in terms of those people who are looking to maximize on their training. And if they want maximum realism, they know that they, they really shouldn't be turning that down. But if they're looking for a training benefit, they know what they're going to get out of that slider. That is the purpose of this video. There is no judgment to a person who uses a lower trainer difficulty at all. This is just to benefit people from getting a better understanding. Because if you cull through the forums and the Facebook groups out there, Good God, there is so much misinformation and so much misunderstanding of this slider, it would make your head spin. So hopefully I can clarify this for you with some really, I think, straightforward real world cases that will make this a lot more easy to understand. So let's talk about how trader difficulty works algorithmically in the game. And you may think that you understand this, but hear me out because I think there's a small nuance in this that people are conflating in their head, which leads people to the, down this whole path of virtual gearing, right? The way that trainer difficulty works is it's a gradient bias, okay? I'm being very specific with those terms, gradient bias. It's not a resistance bias. Don't confuse this with slope mode that you're going to find in workout mode. This is a gradient bias. And what does that mean? Well, when Zwift talks to your smart trainer, which really isn't that smart, what it's doing is it's giving it a gradient value and it works its magic in the back end of the algorithm and it computes how much resistance or how much breaking the trainer needs to simulate that gradient. So what Zwift does is it takes two values from your system. One, it takes the gradient that you see in the upper right hand corner. Two, it takes your settings in the menu for trainer difficulty. And it does very quick math on the fly. It does it second by second, in real time. So it says 10% grade, 50% trainer difficulty. That's a 5% grade. So now it does all of its little magic and calculations in the background and it, it, it lies to your trainer. It's going to lie to it. It's going to tell it 5%. The trainer doesn't give a damn what's on your screen. It's just going to listen to what Zwift tells it to do. And Zwift is going to tell it, hey, I need resistance for 5%, okay? Give me resistance for 5%. And that's all the trainer cares about. It applies the break and it gives you that 5% gradient feel. I think a lot of people think they intellectually understand that point, but they miss this next piece. Now I'm gonna use a really excellent tool for visual aid and it's a DVI cable that I just pulled out of my drawer here. And what people are thinking in their head is they still confuse this with resistance bias. They feel like, okay, if I turn my trainer difficulty down to 50%, it's like somebody's taken a resistance knob on the back of my trainer and turned it down by half. So what it, they think in their head is that maybe you've got, here's, here's your KOM, right? Here's the, the slope and the resistance that you have for your, your KOM. So it, it gets steep and it goes up to the top and then you have your descent. And what they think is happening when you turn your trainer difficulty down is that it's just pulling everything down, right? It's taking everything 
just taking the whole slope and just dragging it down. So it might be easy to think, hey, that's kind of like gearing, right? I, I can just kind of keep a straighter chain line. I can just turn this whole resistance bias down and just keep a straighter chain line. And that way I don't have to worry about always being in those bigger cogs when I climb. The problem is, is that's not what the algorithm is doing. What it's doing is this. It's flattening the grade. It's not pulling the resistance down. It's pulling the gradient down and it's feeding different numbers to your trainer. So I think that's the piece that a lot of people miss. If it was a resistance dial, turning your resistance down and affecting this, the whole world proportionately to that resistance, then it could be more equated to something like a, a gearbox. But because it's flattening out the whole slope, that's not what it's doing. Now, let me give you an example that might help you to wrap your head around this. Let's say you are riding in whatever, you're in Watopia somewhere and you hit a 2% false flat gradient. You're at 100% trainer difficulty. And all of a sudden that 2%, that kicks up to 4%, right? So now you're changing your gradient from two to 4%. That's an increase in gradient of 2%, right? You're kicking up that slope by an additional 2%. Now let's say you did that same exact patch of road, but you turn your trainer difficulty down to 50%. Now, as you're starting along, you've got that uh, grade of 1%, right? Because 50% of two is one. All right, well, I mean, that's pretty easy to follow along with. Really, really not a big deal. What are you talking about? Well, when you go to 4% on the world, now you're only going to 2% in terms of your resistance. Well, from one to 2% is only a 1% change in slope. From two to 4%, it's a 2% change in slope. So now you're talking about changing the dynamics of change between different terrain in the world. You're taking the whole thing and flattening it out. You're not just bringing the whole thing down. If it was going to be a resistance bias, you would just be going from one to 3% or that type of change. You'd still be changing by a 2% grade, but you're not. You haven't turned the resistance dial down. You've turned the actual gradient down. Let's use a more extreme example. Let's talk about maybe you're climbing uphill where this might be a little bit more prevalent. Now, let's say you're going up a switchback somewhere and you're climbing at an 8% gradient and all of a sudden you come up around the corner and it's a 12% gradient, right? You're going from eight to 12. That is a difference of slope of 4%. That's a big deal, right? That's going to involve some shifting. You may have to change your cadence. You might even have to stand up. You might have to put on more power to kind of keep your rider moving. Whatever you choose to do, however you choose to react to that, that's gonna vary by person. But let's say you've turned that trainer difficulty down to 50% again. Well, now your starting gradient is 4%. And when it kicks up to 12% in the world, it's only gonna to go to 6% on your trainer. So instead of increasing your slope by 4%, now you're increasing it by only 2%. And the more extreme you get down the line and the more you extrapolate this idea, you realize how quickly this analogy falls apart. Now there might be an argument, well, maybe I don't have that much undulation. The terrain doesn't change that much. It's not that big of a deal, right? The, the changes in grade up, you know, X climb is not going to be that severe that it's going to make a big difference. So I can just, you know, simulate gearing by turning my trainer difficulty down anyway, because I'm not really getting that much of a benefit by turning it down in terms of change in terrain. Well, the reason that that doesn't work is because of the inertia portion of this equation. This is going to be a little bit more difficult to wrap your head around. And for those of you who have ridden bikes on the real road, uh, this is probably gonna be a lot easier for you to, to understand than those of you who might just be pure Zwifters. But try to follow along with this one because I think it's gonna make a lot of sense if you can kind of wrap your head around it. So when you are riding on a flat road, whether it's on Zwift or on the real road, you start to build up some momentum, right? The bike gets to the point where it can kind of freewheel and coast. You don't necessarily have to pedal, but you know, you're able to pedal and you're able to maintain that speed. You don't want to lose momentum. You want to maintain speed, right? And just like the real road, as your bike would continue to coast, so does your flywheel. You hear that in your trainer, whether you've got a, a Wahoo or a Saris or a Tax, you, you know that, that that flywheel is moving and that's the momentum that you've built up. It's a very high inertia field. That's what you get on very flat roads or when you're going very fast. And the faster you're going, the more momentum you have built up in that rear wheel or the flywheel, the more benefit you're going to have in terms of almost like a pedal assist. Can you think of a time that you were riding, you were going really fast and all of a sudden you look down at your power meter, look up at Zwift and look at your power and you're like, holy crap, it doesn't feel like I'm putting out that much power. Well, that's because maintaining the momentum of the 
bicycle, you're getting that assistance. The, the wheel is moving. You're not having to overcome this low inertia to keep that cassette moving, to keep those, uh, those pedals moving, to keep that rear wheel or flywheel moving. You're getting the benefit of momentum. Now think of a time that you've gone up a steep climb. Right? If you've ever gone up a really steep climb on your road bike, you know you need a certain amount of power to get up the hill. And sometimes you're going so slow because it's so steep that it, you know that every pedal stroke is just lurching that bike forward. You're just dragging it up the hill, right? You don't have a whole lot of momentum built up. In fact, if you stop pedaling, your bike is going to basically roll for a couple of inches and come to a complete stop. If you're on a steep hill in Zwift, you'll notice that your flywheel does the same thing at 100% trainer difficulty. It does move very fast. When you get that flywheel up and moving fast on a flat road and then you stop pedaling, it might continue to spin for like a minute, maybe even more if you have a heavier flywheel. But if you're going to do the same thing on a climb, you realize, man, it, it only spins for a few seconds. It feels like you're almost losing a little bit of speed and momentum every time you make that pedal stroke. You're just constantly overcoming this low inertia. You can almost hear it. If you have a, a louder flywheel, you don't have a lot of fan noise going on, you can almost hear that, that deceleration. And then every time you pedal, you're kind of re-accelerating. That is going to be much more difficult to maintain power. So how is that relevant to trainer difficulty? Well, let's just say for the sake of argument, on a 15% grade, you are able to hold 250 watts at 80 RPM, right? You're not going to have a lot of speed at the flywheel, so you're going to have to kind of maintain that leg speed, you're gonna to have to maintain that power, but you're really not going to get a whole lot of benefit from momentum. Now, let's say you turn that trainer difficulty down to 50%, but you also shift to a harder gear, right? So we're not, we're not talking about comparing the same gearing here. Now you've shifted down to a harder gear so that you can maintain the same 250 watts at the same 80 RPM. If you really listen to that flywheel, it's moving quite a bit faster. And you'll be able to discern that you're actually not going to have the same resistance feeling in your legs by maintaining that momentum and that speed in the flywheel than you were trying to overcome and re-accelerate that flywheel when you had it 100% trainer difficulty. And if you think to the real road, and if you've ever trained with power on the real road, you'll know at least anecdotally that maintaining a certain power number on a flat road, just, it feels easier to you, right? It feels easier than it does on a climb, but you might not be able to wrap your head around why. Well, if you think about the power equation again, power is force times velocity. And if you're getting some velocity provided to you from the momentum of the bike and feeding that wheel velocity back through the cassette and back through the, the chain rings and, and through the pedal stroke. Now you're only responsible for completing force. You don't have to focus so much at maintaining velocity and force. Some of that burden is being taken off your legs. So it's going to feel easier. So the same thing goes for when you're on Zwift and you can keep that flywheel moving a lot faster with a higher inertia feel. It's a lot easier to be able to maintain that power than it is at that really low inertia. So you'll get a number of responses to a subject matter like this. One of them is, well, who gives a shit, right? It's just a game. And that's a fair position to take for those people who really aren't using it as a training tool as much as it is for maybe just general recreational fitness or just to have fun in the game and something that's a little bit more engaging than sitting with the controller in your hand, completely fair. You put that to whatever feels comfortable for you and you do your thing. The reason that I think this is information that could be important to some folks is because if you're training to execute on the railroad, right? You're training to climb. It's, it's really important that when we're stuck indoors that we do the best that we can to try to simulate the demands of our event. And that's where having that trainer difficulty set at 100% is going to have value for you. If you're trying to train those same uh, muscular systems that you would on the real road, trying to get as close as possible with turning your trainer difficulty to 100% is, is important. And falling down that misapprehension that it's virtual gearing is going to just lead you down the wrong path. And the other thing that I'll repeat that I mentioned in the first video, and I'll repeat it again here, and it becomes very contentious and people become very defensive about it, is that turning your trainer difficulty down does give you an advantage in racing. Is it an unfair advantage? Probably not because anybody can turn that down, right? So if you know the playing field and everybody's turning it down, it's really not that unfair. Moreover, the races on Zwift, these are races for fun, okay guys? This, these are not for any type of prize purse. You know, in terms of all the stuff that goes on in terms of actual cheating on Zwift, trainer difficulty is probably the least of the concerns for the amateur level racing. But as I predicted last year, when it comes to sanctioned races, that is locked out. 
anything that has any prizes attached to it, any type of points attached to it, that should be absolutely turned off because we want everybody to just be standardized, whether it's at 50%, 100%, 20%, whatever it is, they want to standardize it to make sure everybody's on a level playing field because they understand the benefits that I've explained here. But the bottom line and the purpose of this video is to have people understand the setting, right? Understand that it's not virtual gearing, understand that it's a gradient bias and it's going to basically adjust your realism and your real world feel when it comes to riding on Zwift. And then you take that knowledge and then you do whatever the hell you want with the setting. You adjust it to your needs. It's for you and it's for nobody else. It is not a measuring stick for riders to compare themselves to or to judge other riders. To say that some flatlander didn't earn a climb up Alpe de Zwift because they did it at 20% uh, trainer difficulty. You know what, they still put out the watts. They still did the work. You know, you, you get these, these two sides of the coin. People who are 100% are bust and if you're not riding at 100%, well, you know, you're not a real cyclist. That's ridiculous. You know, it's just as ridiculous. People that when presented with this information still continue to dig their heels in and attach ego to it because they don't want to admit that, well, maybe they've made the world easier for themselves. But you don't have to conflate the idea of making the world easier based on what it says on the screen with slacking off. You can work really hard and turn that gradient down. It does not have anything to do with your ability as a rider or how hard you're working. It just means that the gradient is communicated to your trainer at a lesser degree than what is showing on the screen. That's it. We're talking about ones and zeros here, folks. It really should not be that big of a deal. But I'm hoping that this video really did lend itself to a better understanding and really dispel this myth of trainer difficulty being a virtual gearbox. But if you guys have any questions, comments, or concerns, feel free to leave them down below. If you got any value from this video, please take the time to hit that thumbs up button. It really helps to get these videos out in front of people who can use this information. Subscribe if you haven't already. If you're interested in some more Zwift videos, I'll link a couple over here for you guys. And as always, I will catch you in the next one. See ya.